Welcome to the third edition of No Sleep. I am your co-host, Regent St. Clair. And I am your other co-host, Jason Vance. And we are the show that's dedicated to bringing you the greatest movies you've probably never heard of. Or if you're a movie collector like we are, then we may be turning you on to some films that you're already familiar with, but may not have visited in quite some time. We are also going to span the globe to find out what the famous as well as the infamous love in the world of cinema. And that's as soon as uh, we get a response from Charles Manson and Dr. Kevorkian. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, there are so many great secret buried treasures in film out there, and we're grateful for this time this evening to share some of them with you. The theme of today's show is the real world. The really real world. And... Uh, we know documentaries have really gotten a bad rap over the years as being way too cold and clinical to actually be entertaining, but we're going to prove to you today that documentaries are some of the best movies around. And it's been extremely difficult for us to even choose our clips today because there are so many great documentaries that we want to turn you on to. In fact, we're going to have another show later on in the season here with even more great documentaries. And, you know, um, one of the reasons that documentaries are so great is because uh, they really show humanity at um, its best. And its worst, but always with an amazing amount of humanity. And um, we uh, really have some great movies here today to show you. Um, so I guess I'll start with the intro for my first one, uh, which is called Gates of Heaven. And uh, it's a documentary about um, a pet cemetery. And it's actually a pet cemetery in Los Altos, California, that they end up breaking a couple laws unintentionally and have to move 450 pets to another burial site. And it really focuses on all the, the crazy characters that you're, you're dealing with. You know, I'm a big animal lover, and it's it kind of strange enough. when you uh, spend $20,000 on a headstone for your pet. Um, but it really shows, especially the people in this small town, even though the film is about the pet cemetery, it really, um, most of the people end up talking about their lives and personal stories, and it's really affecting. I mean, you, you don't get acting like this. If you're at all interested in acting, you should watch this movie because it shows human characteristics at its best. So we're going to take a, a look at just a couple of the wacky people in Gates of Heaven, a film by Errol Morris, who also directed The Thin Blue Line and A Brief History of Time. Can I say the, how you miss them and how you uh, you wake at night and feel around for her, hoping that she's all right and then she's not even there. It's uh, it, it's 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 heartbreaking and then you remember that she is gone, but you get to thinking where she is and you know where she is and you're happy where she is and the next day you go out and take flowers and maybe meditate a little bit and think of. How many, how often maybe you cried into her fur? People like people because they like one another. Yep. And there are so many uh, unusual scenes in this film. And, and of course, that one has a, a part about an animal. But uh, my favorite scene, as you know, is this woman who is talking about her son and a car that she bought him. And she's kind of like in her own little world. And obviously, when you make a documentary, a lot of times you're talking to people who don't get to talk to anyone very much. Very lonely people in this movie. And, uh, that woman, that little four or five minute piece that she's on is worth watching the movie for that alone. <laughs> I mean, all the rest is an added bonus. And uh, this one we're talking about in the other clip, uh, I guess a car drives by behind the camera, man, and you hear a car honk or something, and the woman just is totally scattered and is like, oh, that was a car. It's so it's kind of nutty. The people are what makes this, this movie special it's and actually it is, it very, very lighthearted, very funny and and touching i mean these people really obviously do love their animals very much you know as many people do and my first film uh that i'm going to talk about today is called streetwise it came out in 1985 directed by uh martin bell and the music was by tom waits excellent, and excellent score um this film i think is a prototype for many other documentaries about homeless kids and homeless people i think that have come since then um, and perhaps the Jerry Springer show. Absolutely. You know, Jason and I, we consider ourselves to be pretty hardcore 
Uh, we've seen it all. We've seen stuff that you guys cannot even imagine. But that said, a film like this about homeless kids in Seattle, it really touches you. It really moves you because they've got some kind of a spark. They've got some kind of a, an optimism that you don't know where it comes from. It's, it's someplace inside the human spirit. But um, we'll show a clip uh, coming up here where uh, a young girl who I believe is 13 or 14 years old is a hooker and her mother knows this and they spend a little quality time together here at, uh, at mom's house. So we're going to roll the clip here and uh, see if you can see this wonderful family life. Quality time. He doesn't work. He depends on my mom a lot, which is not right. I think the man should support the woman. He says, she doesn't have the money and all this other shit, and I say, it's because of you, because you spend her money on beer, and she doesn't have time for me. Now my mom's in a mess she can't get out of. I feel really sorry for her. Be a year. Year has gone by fast, huh? Huh? Mom? Yes. Don't bug me. I'm drinking. You know, I think this was probably the first documentary I actually remember seeing that I was entertained by, entertained by and actually thought it was a great movie. Um, it's so sad watching these kids that are like nine years old out on the street pulling tricks and smoking cigarettes. But it's even sadder to see the parents who just don't seem to care. I mean, one, one of the when little girls' mother works in a, a little kind of coffee shop diner place and every couple of weeks it's like okay for the girl to stop by and like get a hamburger and then mom sends her on her way again to go like out on the street and it's really heartbreaking I mean definitely you should seek this movie out and there's also a, a very interesting um, photography book based on a lot of the kids in this movie exactly and the photographs really capture um, the sadness the of these story children. right there it's really amazing um, actually this whole film was begun as an offshoot of, I believe, either a Time or a Life magazine pictorial. Right, And uh, right. that's the people who actually put this whole thing together. Uh, my next choice is um, a really excellent, intense documentary called Harlan County, USA. And it actually won the 1976 um, Academy Award for Best Documentary. Um, it's directed by a woman named Barbara Copel, and it takes place in a very small town in Kentucky, Harlan County, and it deals with a group of coal miners who are on strike, and they're dealing with the unions and the thing is these people make no money and what they're fighting so hard for is like a little bit more than an hour, a know? little bit more than no money most of the people that live in this town don't even have um, running water, running water or indoor plumbing and there this movie has a lot more than just a small town I mean it has like a mafia conspiracy where they take out murder one of the union guys and his and his family and these people fight so desperately to hold on to what little they have I mean, it, it really has some intense things. Now, one thing, I don't know, everybody in this town seems incredibly ugly, and I, I don't quite know what's up with that, but uh, maybe, it, maybe it's the water. So oh. let's take a look and see, see how passionate this woman is. Three or four of uh, damn little gun thugs get on him and start kicking a woman and hitting a woman, and then, then a, 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 another one come over and, and start beating a man and, and getting four or five of them on him and then see a... A uh, basil college holding a gun and, and calling a, 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 one of a union man that believes in these union men, saying, I want you to get that nigger. You hear that nigger? Get that nigger. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And it's, it's time for us uh, to, to stand together and, 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 and get just as violent as they are. Right. They're violent, so by God, you fight far with far. It seemed like they were pretty well organized to me this morning. And we're going to have to get... Wow. Wow, I mean... indeed. And the thing that's amazing about this, uh, this film to me is we've all seen movies like Fist, Norma Ray, films about organizing, union organizing, and it's dramatic and it's, it's engrossing. This is the real thing. These people, there's a scene that we talked about before where a, uh, one of the strikers goes nose to nose with a trooper, a state trooper, who is obviously in the pocket of the, of the mining company. The, uh, n moments after that, you've got guys from the mining company who are trying to bring scabs into work, walking around the streets with their guns in their hands. Oh, and the yeah. cops are doing nothing. It's, it's pretty it's interesting crazy. to see little people in this little country town doing drive-by shootings, oh, which they, they really are. 
And what they're fighting for, like Jason said, is just this pittance, this little tiny bit more than nothing. But this is what their lives are about, is these little tiny, little inch forward, inch forward. And they're risking their, they are risking their lives, their families' lives. There's a lives. great sequence, too, where they actually go to New York to try oh, yeah. to protest this. And oh, yeah. to see them in a big town is, is very entertaining. Well, the irony there is there's a cop talking to them on the streets of New York. And that cop is totally sympathetic to what they're going through and can't believe what's, there, what's going this on This movie with them. make you feel good about your life. However yeah. bad you think you have it, watch Harlan County USA and you'll be thankful for you, that you have a bed to sleep in. Definitely. We have no problems. In any case, my next film is Brother's Keeper, which uh, came out in 1993. And um, a very, very unique film about three uh, elderly dairy farmer brothers. Uh, and one of them is accused of killing another one of them Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but for some reason, the authorities swoop down on this, make it a huge media event, and these guys are the sweetest old bunch of guys. And um, the filmmakers really did a fabulous job. They take you down a path where you're fascinated whether, whether he did it or not. Halfway through the movie, it doesn't matter to you if they did it or not. It's yeah, about the people. That's right. It's magnificent. And uh, we've got a clip for you here uh, to, sh to show some of the... Um, the things they're dealing with, with going up against the machine. So here's a clip from Brothers Keeper. I wouldn't hurt any more if been my kid. Because you wouldn't believe we, it. We, we knew that the kid, you know, we've known him all our lives. He wasn't a kid, but he's younger than we are. Well, Christ, he's 60 years a old. Year and we're 80. Younger. Hell of a lot. Of and after they got his whiskers off, he looked younger. Yeah. He looked like Jesus Christ when they, when they brought him in. Did you see him before he had his whiskers? Yeah. He made me think of Jesus Christ all of a, uh, in a way, you know. Not that he was that big of a saint or anything, you know, but uh, he was never any hellraiser. And there we go. Isn't that funny how they don't even listen to each other? They're just obviously you can tell they've been together like 50 a long years. Time. You know, that's that's what happens when you're a, a couple for that long. But you know. There is also kind of a, an underlying uneasiness with Brothers Keeper, and I really was kind of creeped out by the brothers the first time I saw them, because these are like grown men, the three brothers, and they all like sleep in the same little bed, and there's definitely some like kind of inbred weirdness going on, but it's so interesting and so, so unusual and so quirky that um, you really want to check it out, because it is set up like a, almost a suspense thriller about exactly. if he actually committed this murder or not. But um, you fall in love with and these guys, And it's really great too. because the whole town rallies around him and comes to their support. A town that didn't give a darn about them any time previously suddenly is rallying behind their boys. And, and basically saying, hey, if, if he did kill them, that's their business. It's family business. You know, let the family take care of it. Um, very exceptional. Very exceptional. Um, now we actually have a new segment that we're going to be introducing to you. Yes, we do. And uh, it's called Killer Picks. And what we're going to be doing is we've uh, sent letters to quite a few convicted um, killers to find out what their favorite movies are. Because, you know, just because you're incarcerated or a different walk of life, that doesn't mean you don't enjoy movies. And it's kind of fascinating us to find out what some of these guys like. So and we, uh, have we, have, we haven't gotten a response yet back from uh, Jack of Orkian or Charles Manson. But we have gotten a response from a convicted murderer. From Jim at the uh, Ironwood Jim. State Prison. Um, the big guns are still holding out on us, you know, but we'll get them. And Jim has some interesting things to say. Um, his, the film that he chose as his favorite, even though he is limited to GPG and uh, PG-13 films, is What Dreams May Come, starring Robin Williams. And he writes that, um, that uh, he was deeply moved by Robin Williams' compelling performance of a man so committed to love for his wife that he would endure an eternity in purgatory, um, slash hell, to be with her. Um, then he writes, I'm privileged to know that feeling. Ah! So, so um, it's, it's really good that he responded, and we thank him for that. And I think it's also really good that he's in prison. So uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you for that, Jim. Thank you, Jim. We like the movie, too. And uh, we also have some, uh, some other uh, hot picks here from uh, other uh, fans of the show who have emailed us and uh, sent us postcards, etc. That's these. And you should, too. And so should you. Send in your uh, call us we'll give you the quick rundown on some of the, uh, the favorites of our viewers here. Tori from uh, Hollywood loves Super Fuzz. And the reason he says is it's the best movie on earth for many reasons, but the one that stands out in my mind is that it's the best movie ever. 
There you go. The best that's, movie ever. That's Tori. Jessica from Riverside loves The Crow because of its darkness and the soundtrack, and uh, she thinks it's very unique. And Peter from Concord, California, uh, loves the Rocky Horror Show. And why is that? Because he's seen it 500,000 times. <laughs> Um, I have Bud from Walnut Creek, California, a 70-year-old gynecologist, and he chose the African Queen. What a coincidence. I think there's some connection there. Um, we have Scott, and... who chose Curse of the Demon. Great selection, oh, yes. Scott. Um, that's an old black and white film. Look it up. And he wrote a really cool little review of it, too. And actually, I have a, <laughs> a uh, broadcast quality master of that film, Curse of the Demon. It's a hard one to find. Very, very cool and very ahead of its time. And we have Carol Jean, who enjoyed The Parenthood. And also Heather at Spank Magazine said that she likes Reservoir Dogs because it has all the elements of good screenwriting and the dialogue is, of course, fresh. Um, Matt Montgomery from Chicago. His favorite film is Jaws. Didn't elaborate much on that, but hey, what can you say about Jaws? Hey, uh, Jaws. Brad from Los Angeles likes Friday the 13th because it's so real to him. <laughs> and, uh, and Brad... Brad lives in a scary world. Yeah. And uh, lastly on my list, uh, uh, Alex from Antioch, California. Uh, his favorite film is Jacob's Ladder, which is a very amazing film. And he is a very, uh, very bummed that uh, and, there were some scenes that were taken out. Yep, and I'm going to skip right to Tom's letter, um, Tom Skeleton, who uh, wrote us a letter, letter saying that he's never heard of most of these movies we talked about, and that was real Neato Burrito. Neato Burrito, and that's going to be our new phase. Neato Burrito, guys. He did choose some uh, strange titles like uh, Pokemon, How to Make an American Quilt, Jingle All the Way. Um, and Little Buddha and Six Pack with Kenny Rogers. So thanks, Tom, and need a burrito to you, too. Absolutely. And um, now we're going to go on to, unfortunately, my last choice of the show. Um, it's called Eileen Warrenoff, The Selling of a Serial Killer. And it's about this woman who was uh, started prostituting when she was about 14. And she's actually an interstate prostitute that hangs out on the freeways and picks up dri dr uh, truck drivers, that kind of thing. And she actually ends up murdering a man in self-defense the first time, but then goes on um, and ends up killing about six or seven guys. The thing that's interesting about it is, is that after she's indicted and put in prison, all these people start crawling out of the woodwork, these sleazy people, to, to attach themselves to her, including a, an attorney that is kind of like this hippie guy that um, as soon as he signs her up, he changes her plea in the courtroom to no, no contest. He, he, he hooks up with this uh, supposedly Christian woman that adopts her, even though Eileen Warnoff is like... 45 40 years something old, years old yeah. and just completely uses her to exploit Eileen for their own good, and thus Eileen becomes the real victim in this story. Um, let's take a look. This is her adoptive mother um, bargaining an interview. I've never done this. I have never done this before. But you could talk to Steve. I mean, do you think it'd be less than that? Yeah, I honestly, I don't know. It depends how much you talk to Steve. How many days you want to be here? What you want to see? Do you want the tapes? Do you want everything? The new stuff? Um, all of the personal, the poems, the letters, the the artwork. I mean, it, it, I'm sure he'll write up some kind of contract. For this you get this, and for this you get everything. Uh. Talk to him. He's my agent. <laughs> An agent. Do you believe this? Uh. Well, <laughs> this is the woman who it's love. This is the woman who adopted uh, Eileen, and as Jason said, what a clear illustration of somebody who is the victim and not the perpetrator. Actually, everyone that this, this female serial killer killed. There's real good reasons. It's mostly self-defense, and when it's not self-defense, well. it's totally. It's pretty justifiable. There were a couple guys just looking to get off. Come on. But still, she, she totally comes off by, uh, like the victim. And uh, Nick Broomfield, excellent director, and he, he puts himself into his documentaries. And he yes. really kind of puts himself in the face of the people that he's, uh, he's dealing with. Sort and of like Mike Moore's style from Roger much, and Me. Very much. But um, it's, it's just a travesty. What has happened to this woman is an amazing travesty. And the, what's worse, like you say, these, this crazy lawyer who he, he writes these goofy songs about her. He's smoking weed in the car on the way to go see her. <laughs> okay? Changes her plea in court to like guilty, no contest. It's insane. And this Christian woman who uh, adopts her is it's, it's unspeakable. It's evil what she's doing with this. What, this is just terrible. And now I believe it's time for your next choice. Yes, it is. It's 35 <laughs> up.
directed by Michael Apted. And the funny thing about this is the same week that uh, the latest installment of this series, which is the latest installment is 42 Up, uh, came out. The same week was his other film came out, uh, the new James Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough. It's nice to have two, the, your two films in the theater, your little tiny documentary and your huge James Bond movie. Um, 35 Up started out as a BBC, um, I guess special or documentary, where they filmed a group of seven-year-old children um, from various socioeconomic uh, places um, to kind of see how, how if your life starts out in a certain way, if you have money or if you don't have money, really that's what it's about, how your life will go. Um, I think that he's pretty well made his point by now. With because every up. seven years or They come back every seven years and visit the kids again. So we kind of see them develop as human beings and growing up and what have you. And uh, the, the, the kid that we're going to see here in this clip is, forgive me, he's one of the rich kids. So I think you'll see the point that uh, the director's trying to make here. So let's take a look at this um, kid who has all the options in the world at seven years old. Leave the school, I'm going to call it court. And then I will be going to Westminster boarding school if I pass the exam. And then we think I'm going to um, Cambridge in Trinity Hall. John went to Westminster School and read law at Christ Church, Oxford. I do believe parents have a right to educate their children as they think fit. And I think someone who works on the assembly line in some of these car factories and earning a huge wage could well afford to send their children to, to private school if they wanted to. At 21, we asked him what career he would pursue. Might be at the bar. Doing what? Perhaps transfer practice. I now have a career. I'm a barrister. Um. See, he made it. Said he was going to be a barrister at seven years old and wanted to be that. And that's exactly that. what he did. Now, some of the non-wealthy kids in the show, they've had to like shoot for their dreams, and most of them have failed. Yeah, my little subtitle for this this installment of the Up series, 35 Up, is the bitter years, um, yeah. because a lot of people are getting very disillusioned in their 30s about not accomplishing what they set out to do when they were seven. And in case you didn't catch that, this is a series of films that right. there's seven up, 14 up, et cetera. Right. Every seven years, they go back to the same group of people to see what they've done with their life. And, um, and it is very admirable that, that Michael Apted, who has gone on to do big Hollywood blockbusters every seven years, still goes back and does this project of his. And 35 Up is a really good starting point, because as you saw from the clip, it does go back to some of the other movies. Um, but 7 Up is, is very interesting too with the, the wide-eyed innocence of youth <laughs> before you get into uh, the decline of life. Definitely. Ironically, 40 and 42 Up, um, they're not so bitter. Yep. And they've kind of got grown up and are a little bit calmer. But that's why I think 35 Up is the best one in the series. Well, you know what? That's all the time we have for tonight. Um, but a few other great documentaries that I would like to recommend, we just didn't have a chance to show clips or talk about them, is um, Kurt and Courtney and Heidi Fleiss. Those are two different movies by Nick Bromfeld, who directed Eileen Warrenoff, the one we talked about earlier. Kurt and Courtney is about the conspiracy about Courtney Love murdering Kurt Alleged. Cobain. Alleged conspiracy. I think it's true. I believe it. Check it out. It brings up some interesting points. And uh, Heidi Fleiss, of course, the Hollywood madam. Um, also, Blood in the Face, and um, another film called Jupiter's Wife, about a very eccentric woman living in Central Park that has a very interesting past once you start digging a little. And Paris is Burning, about a group of um, black drag queens in New York and the uh, sacrifices that they've had to make and in their life. Very interesting. And a few other films that we didn't have time to show you today, clips-wise, that I'd like to add to the list is uh, also Sick, The Life and Death of Bob Flanagan, Supermasochist. Of course, you may remember Bob from the uh, Nine Inch Nails video, Happiness and Slavery. He's the one who didn't make it out of the room. Uh, of course, uh, Brief History of Time, about Stephen Hawking, uh, Paradise Lost, uh, the most charming and optimistic American movie, which came out recently, is a must-see, absolute must-see, especially if you're really not very optimistic like Jason and I are. It really kind of fills your heart with a lot of optimism. And uh, also Diane Keaton's film Heaven, which is about heaven and is very uplifting and very funny, interesting in its diversity of the way that people look at heaven. And uh, if you want any further information on any of the films that we've talked about or on previous episodes, 
please make sure and give us a call. Let us know what your favorite movies are. 310-712-1973 uh, is the number. Or you can email us or contact us in various ways at our uh, website at www.nosleeptv.com. And um, we're going to make up for having a little slow start on this show by having our very first contest. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, we're having a little contest. The first person that can correctly call in or email us or send us a postcard and naming the clips in the opening sequence, sequence of our show, show, like when we're the little boys watching the movies, name all the clips in order, and you're going to receive a brand new, beautiful, no tea, no sleep no t -shirt. sleep shirt. No sleep t-shirt. Just like this one here. Just like that one. Whoa! Will you look at that? Oh, right man. Back. So give us a call. Send us an email. Let us know, and you might win. And uh, we want to hear from you. So, as Jason said, email us or call us. Tell us what your favorite movies are. And, you know, we might just read it on the air, like we read uh, some of these other folks' uh, picks, and we'll share the sort of details with our viewers. So thanks so much for stopping by and make sure and stop by again we're gonna have a lot more interesting show ideas coming up for you bye 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 Yeah.